Hello and welcome to News Click and I am Nilanjan Mukhopadhyay and you are watching Present, Past and the Future. Future historians are going to look at the year 2019 and the elections in two parts, pre-Pulwama and post-Pulwama. Prior to Pulwama on the 14th of February, quite paradoxically, also the Valentine's Day, which actually started an entire new chapter in mutual hatred and animosity. Prior to that, it looked like that the ruling party of Prime Minister Narendra Modi was on a weak wicket. That the entire issue was being fought on issues of unemployment, rising rural uh, crisis, on, uh, on, you know, on questionable deliveries of the government. By and large, basically, there were estimates, you know, that the government was not doing, that the ruling party was not doing very well. But Pulwama completely changed it because suddenly it became an opportunity for Mr. Modi to do what he does best, which is to to propagate muscular nationalism. In the days immediately after the attack on the CRPF convoy in Pulwama, there were three basic narratives which set into place in India. The first narrative was, what would be India's retaliation? What is the Prime Minister going to do against Pakistan or the Pakistan-based handlers of the terrorists who uh, struck in the convoy? The second narrative was, the immediate targeting of people from Kashmir in different parts of India and those who were opposed to the narrative which was being presented by the government or by the ruling party. The third narrative was that of the politics of it, that this after all is going to be something which is going to play out very majorly in the elections as, as, as uh, develop, things develop. Eventually, a lot has happened since then, primarily with uh, the air strikes against uh, Pakistan, then thereafter the Pakistan violating our space, coming in, you know, sending their aircrafts here. We also retaliating, capturing or capture of the Indian wing commander there, and thereafter his release. So a lot has happened, both diplomatically as well as militarily. These three areas, which ultimately get down connected, which is politics, diplomacy, and military, is something that needs to be understood. And it is going to play out very majorly in the elections, which is going to soon be acquiring the entire mind space of all the people in this country. Now, to discuss these issues, you know, basically what I've done is that I've put together three of us. You know, I have Mr. Vivek Karju, who spent a lifetime in, in the Indian Foreign Service, who handled, most importantly, very important charges, including the sensitive during the, the, the desk, during the Kandahar crisis. He's also been an Indian ambassador in different countries, including Afghanistan, most importantly. Praveen Sani, a former uh, journalist, who's also the editor of uh, former journalist, by and that Praveen and I, we worked together in a newspaper many years ago. He's the editor of this uh, important defense magazine called Force, a very independent voice, somebody who looks at military policy very clearly. Very, and and, and uh, critically. Mr. Karju, let me begin with you by trying to get some kind of a diplomatic assessment and also this very intriguing fact which I noticed, you know, that, that when the de-escalation happened, the first indication that something was happening came from the American President, Donald Trump, when he announced all the way, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, while he was traveling to the, the Korean, uh, handling the Korean issue said that something attractive news is going to come. Now, in diplomacy, it has been claimed by Mr. Modi that we have been able to get the support of people much more, other countries, much more than we have ever been able to do so. Now, if any gains have come, if any support has come, it wouldn't come absolutely free, as they say, that nothing is free in life. Uh, abroad, what you know, trying to understand a diplomatic assessment from you and also that if there is going to be a future price for the kind of support which has been extended to India. Uh, I'll try to place this in some perspective. Right. You've raised the question of the American president right. comment. 
India's traditional policy is that uh, India-Pakistan relations are direct and bilateral exactly. and there is no place for <coughs> third parties. I believe that, uh, and history shows this, that when it comes to long-term issues with Pakistan, mm. say the Jammu and Kashmir issue, we do not admit anyone to come in. I think if anyone, even the Americans, want to play a role, they'll be rebuffed and the world has accepted a position right. that unless both sides, both countries want, the Pakistanis of course want, but unless India also wants, we will not do. And we remain committed to the composite dialogue process. Well, uh, we remain in principle committed to the composite dialogue process, but there is a caveat. Mm -hmm. And that caveat is that talks and terror don't, don't go, together. go together. That's been our basic position, though at times governments have resiled from this position. Right. Now, this position holds. But when it comes to a crisis situation, mm -hmm. then it is not unnatural for the major powers to take an interest. Okay. Because the possible or the potential of disruption of regional peace and security or international also going peace to impact and security them. impacts them. Right. At that stage, no country can rebuff their coming diplomatically or at a political level and talking right. and occasionally make, making suggestions to try to diffuse the situation. Yes. That has been the pattern as far back as I can remember. Right. Crisis situations, they come in. Now, the Americans quite clearly after Pulwama as indeed many other countries, would be in discussions with us and in discussions with, with Pakistan. I don't take this as third party intervention because I'm clear in my mind the third party intervention, the connotation is... Is when you're actually talking? No, when you're actually looking at the longer issues, okay. the basic issues. In this case, you can't obviously rebuff. We, if supposing there was a potential of war between the superpowers, right. the big powers, You'll take, you'll talk to them because it interests, impacts on you directly. Similarly, they, they do so. So I do think that in this case, the Americans were talking to us, they were talking to the Pakistanis, and what the American president said was a reflection of that discussion, separate discussions, okay. and uh, his diplomats would be telling him that there's good news coming. Okay, uh, just one question uh, uh, to this. Uh, after the de-escalation, we have seen in several speeches, Mr. Modi is repeatedly saying that the world views India with greater respect. And There's he claims, and he <laughs> seeks to claim political kudos for this. Well, politicians, all politicians claim kudos. So, Mr. Modi is not alone in that. Especially respect. because this is an election year also. Also, yes, of course, election year. And uh, while on national security issues... So, he's the, stressing that this is a major achievement of his government that he's been able to get the international backing in order to, to ensure that Pakistan does not escalate any further. Uh, uh, let me put that in context too, yes. if you permit me. The traditional Indian approach has been to absorb terror. Right. It's been there all through. It was there even in after in Mumbai. Point. Mumbai too, it was there. Now, the first change came after the Uri terrorist right. attack when Mr. Modi uh, ordered surgical strikes. Right. This time around, and there were no elections then, so quite clearly he was in signaling to Pakistan and to the international community that India would get... India is becoming a no-nonsense state. India would get... I, mean, I don't look upon it in these terms. Right. I look upon it, if you permit me, in a little more conceptual framework, that India would get its conventional forces into play, something which Pakistan warns against, mm. if it thinks it's necessary in the case after a terrorist attack. Mm. This is a doctrine thing. This time around, and it was unrelated to the elections, mm. this time around, he's carried that forward. Okay. 
And he has said, I will get my things, my forces into play. The, when he says that the international community has not, has been supportive, I would put it a little differently. No one has criticized us. Right. Except the Chinese who said something like... About sovereignty of so a country has sovereign. to be respected. No one else criticized us. And I do believe that in many parts of the world, this question was always asked, when will India's strategic patience run out? Right. My last point. He's taking political kudus for it because I think he was in search of what I say a dominant narrative. Right. I've discussed with you, yes. this with you in the past that whenever there's a dominant no narrative and a, a person who is politically dominant, then the marriage and of the two... who has two, a capacity to harness that politically. Harness it politically, then the marriage of the two leads to electoral, great electoral success. It's been there in the past. So I do think that uh, there is deep potential for getting that dominant narrative uh, on this account. Praveen Sani, uh, both after surgical strike and as well as after this round of military act exchange, if I can use that particular phrase, uh, you have consistently argued that India has compromised its conventional deterrence. I would want to understand from you that as to how in this time, you know, when there's a general gung-ho in the atmosphere, you know, that general feel good that India has actually been able to avenge the killings of the CRPF soldiers, that India has secured a lot and actually been able to set a new paradigm. How and why are you arguing that our conventional deterrence has been compromised? So, first of all, there's a difference between uh, perception and reality. Now, which narrative is uh, accepted as higher is a matter of, you know, uh, how much people understand military power. Now, talking of reality, let me get to the, to the bare bones what has happened without getting technical. So, what has happened is that the, I'm talking of the air, air element first, right. because this is the first time it has happened. Uh, we can talk 2016 later. So, as far as this air element is concerned, what has happened is that uh, stealthily, we did breach the LC right. because I am convinced the LC has been breached and this has been accepted by the Pakistanis. Right. If it was not breached, they would not have retaliated. Exactly. So, how much it is breached, it's a matter of, you know, we can keep discussing. Now, how many casualties are there, it's immaterial. The point is, we stealthily... BJP no, leaders are we, coming up it with different matter. figures. See, I'm just getting you to the basic point, what has happened. The LC has been breached by us right. stealthily. Now, the retaliation has come the next day... Broad daylight. In broad daylight. Right. Now, pause. What it means is, they were not deterred by us. Right. This is a straight conclusion. Now, what is deterring? In modern war, it is the air element, not to go in the details, which will be the pivot of warfare. Right. Which means that the Pakistan Air Force and the Pakistan state is not deterred and they come in broad daylight too and they breach our LC. Mm -hmm. Our side, however they may do, it's not important, but it's been breached. And we have accepted that what they have done was a military aggression. We have accepted what they have done was an act of war. We did not retaliate. So in the first instance, they were not deterred. In the second instance, we did not have A, the political will to retaliate, and B, we did not have the military capabilities to retaliate. And this is where on the one hand, the conventional deterrence... Will you, you know, it's quite significant what you're saying, that we did not have the military capability. Would you elaborate on this? How yes, you're saying, yes. You know, I mean, this is the easiest thing to explain. This is the easiest thing to explain. You and I and everybody reads the paper every day. Right. We know the Air Force needs this, this, this. We know the Army needs all this. We know the, Air Force, the Navy needs all this. We know the capabilities are not there. Capacities are not there. So Modi has already declared, you know, that if we had Rafael, then the story would no, have been no, completely no, that different. That is politics. The bison can do a 
as much of a job in this thing as a Rafale can. Right. We are not talking war right now. Right. We are talking of that first step where we did not retaliate to a military aggression. Right. What Mr. Modi is talking of is war. Right. That's something entirely different. Right. All right. So we did not have the military capability. We did not have the political will. Both the things. Let me explain the political will. The first part was easier. If you recall, on the 26th itself, right. they held a meeting of the uh, National Command Authority. Hmm. Now, what is National Command Authority in Pakistan? It is actually nothing. It basically is where the entire the government, the government today, government which is which is the political leadership, the military leadership, they sit down and they are supposed to discuss the nuclear issues. Right. The reality is the nuclear is the entire nuclear thing is with the Pakistan Army. Right. It's but, not there with the civilian authority. But the signaling was done here. Right. The signaling was done here that we've held this. The problem in this country is, and I say that I have been saying this for the last four decades, mm -hmm. nothing has changed. And what has not changed is, after we have done the nuclear test, we have never bothered to understand that there is a need for a seamless transition from the conventional to the nuclear right. aspect. We do not understand and all politicians are scared of this. Right. So you need a political will to fight a war. You see, they were aggressive, they were ready for the escalation. We, are, we were not ready for an escalation. So basically what I am saying is, we have, whether we accept or we don't accept, because nobody will accept what I am saying, because it doesn't go against the national narrative. Right. The truth of the matter is, we have exposed our Air Force. We have exposed that we did not have the war fighting capability. And here is the bottom line. Therefore, to my mind, like the 2016 surgical strike, the Air Force has been used for publicity. I have been seeing, uh, Mr. Karju, that you have been disagreeing. But also, besides disagreeing, I want to also take the steer the conversation a bit further. The basic objective, we should not forget, is cross-border terrorism. And also, besides whatever is done by forces across the border, there is also that there is a ground reality in India as to our political situation, which allows cross-border terrorism to prosper. There is a political problem. We need a certain kind of a resolution of a problem in Kashmir. That is also there. So where do we go from here now? How I'll, do we go? I'll, I'll, and does this government show any will in wanting to I'll, go? I'll, I'll, I'll give you my take yeah. on this. With all with the deepest respect. And I'll be very brief. Sure. I followed this for many years. Professionally. Of course you have. You, know. you handled Kandahar. After, Kanda Haar, you know, after so. 1998, the test, the Pakistanis said, that India should never get its conventional forces into play because there is the danger of nuclear escalation. Right. So seamlessly, it might go into nuclear war. They don't have a no first use doctrine. They don't you know. have. Right. The object was to paralyze us. It was that if you get your forces into play, use your forces to counter a terrorist attack, mm. to send a signal through us, then it's much too dangerous. And they used to tell the world powers that please counsel India restraint. True. We followed that even after Mumbai. We absorbed it. Which we don't anymore. Let me just complete that. We absorbed it and we started saying that terrorism does not constitute a strategic threat. And therefore, it should be handled politically, diplomatically, because our GDP and some strategic thinkers were saying that, look, what is the loss to GDP? I believe this was wrong. <coughs> I believe that terrorism have extra has extracted a terrible price, including a social price. Now, over the last over 2000, from 2016 till now, these two attacks have put major holes in that doctrine of nuclear, of 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 nuclear overhang. Okay. And what is the signaling today, as I interpret it? 
the signaling is that escalation does not begin with the use of conventional forces. It begins with the use of terror. And India has no option but to apply force in a manner it wishes. Now, I am convinced that this will send a very sobering effect to Pakistan. Quite clearly, right. one act will not deter them because there are proponents of the nuclear overhang doctrine in Pakistan who would say, we have to attack massively, we have to convene the national the National Command Authority to signal to the world that escalation is taking place and you should prevent so, Indians from doing something. Uh, somebody like me would argue that while it is important to send a signal to Pakistan to stop cross-border terrorism, aiding forces which are working against India, it is also important for us to look at the issue from a political perspective to try to see what are the issues, what are the problems which are there within the country as to which allow the space for some third party to come and intervene with I will you. answer that. I believe that there are many issues in India, many center state issues. Right. I for one have always believed that in Jammu and Kashmir we have two separate issues. Hmm. One is a center state issue. Kashmir is a part of the Union and we have to address the problem of the Jammu and, of Jammu and Kashmir, especially particularly the Kashmir Valley, within the confines of our political system. Right. That's our internal problem. We have an external problem with Pakistan because of territories under their control, which we believe are ours. The real difficulty is that the Pakistanis have developed such intrusive capabilities in our part of JNK mm. that we are finding it extremely difficult to address them. And historically, we have not been able to address them. Now, we can have differences of views within our polity mm. as to how to address Jammu and Kashmir. Fine, fair. There is a problem of great unhappiness in JNK and some people can be very unhappy with the way this government has handle that. But there are two separate issues and let's be mindful of this. So third party intervention is not happening in that issue. It is third parties come in when there is a crisis and that is where I drew a distinction. Right. Praveen, we also have an election, you know, which simply is going to become the most overbearing narrative over the next few weeks. In such a situation where the attempt of the political leadership is going to be to maximize the gains, you know, whatever are the projected gains of this entire conflict. Do you think that there is any probability of this being tackled in a reasonable and a rational manner within the country over the next few years? What being tackled? You know, what we are talking about, that there is a problem which is across the border which we know because of Pakistan and <coughs> so forces. you see it's but like we have this. a political yeah. we have to talk to people in Kashmir yeah so the first thing is you know just a bit of a clarification here yeah. you know uh, let me simplify it further it's something like this I have a neighbor who's very strong all right, right. and we've got a common hedge I will dare not cut his hedge because he I will not do it because I know he is very powerful but he will cut my hedge and I can do bugger all about it. Now, what I'm trying to put across to you is, when people say that we have to do more strikes, the problem is before that you have to build military power. That is the whole problem. If you have military power, now compare it with China. Do you know or how many people know in this country that what we keep talking of this transgressions from both sides are actually one-sided? We are not going anywhere across the line of control. In fact, all along the line of control, our patrolling limits are well inside because we know that they are a formidable foe militarily. Right. So what I am saying is all this is fine if you do not build up your capabilities and the Pakis have assessed we do not have capabilities, which is why they did what they did on the 27th morning. So to go back again that we will do this again, it is making a political statement. You see, because we have to first get our military power. I mean, who doesn't know 
we have shortages who doesn't know we do not have a defense industrial complex who doesn't know there are no military reforms here mm. who doesn't know that we have a very limited budget i mean these are things which everybody knows if i mean this is no state secret so if you do not have a military power in place now th talking of the surgical strike the then foreign secretary jay shankar has accepted to the parliament committee headed by shashi tharoor that these were low level low level counter terror operations and we went and called them surgical strike that this label has stuck they were not because the indian army i know in the 90s and the 20s you know the first part of the century the indian army has done raids what is raid raid is that you cross the lc and hit a pakistani post and what was done in 2016 september was we just hit the launch pad we never went to the post so the point i'm making is for god sake first build up a escalation capability build up your military power then everything all these theories are fine you know mr karju you know as we get into towards the concluding part of this uh, discussion you know there's something very important which we also need to understand that what is also playing out politically politically it is being played out that any tendency to ask questions is being frowned upon in this country we are actually reaching a stage where we possibly Uh, face the prospect of the indian elections which are called to be a festival of democracy not being a festival anymore but instead being a very singular narrative where only one narrative is allowed you already had this horrible incident in karnataka where a professor was asked to kneel because he had a slight different way of uh, looking at how the pakistan prime minister decided to release uh, the indian uh, pilot so we have a situation where the basic democratic culture of this country is being compromised how it plays out politically is something which we have to see and what will happen in the elections what verdict is going to be there what kind of government is going to come what policies is going to be uh, pursuing is something which time will say but somebody as a as a person who has spent a lot of time in in the world diplomacy you know how does this play out diplomatically that you have a changed political you know a greater amount of bellicosity within the country that you have this entire rush for a muscular nationalism being propounded by the government of the day i think this is an internal thing my experience shows that foreign countries have the economic interests which are preeminent right and they don't give a tinkers damn to an internal situation unless it would impact on their interest particularly their economic interests having said that i do believe that our constitutional values should never be compromised Go the government any government has to answer questions having said that i do think also that the timing and the manner in which a question is put is also significant and that is so not only in india it is so in my diplomatic experience all over the world for example and i do believe this that we'll have to very closely look at these structures there is need for structures to be created in our parliament of the kind that exist in several democracies right where accountability is exercised accountability is exercised and also this is through, important point through, through committees multi party committees and perhaps there the members of the multi party of these committees swear an we oath do, of secrecy we do have a fairly robust committee system no, but where you, question which are bipartisan but, where but, questions no, are asked but those, he was referring to the committee no, which is headed I, I, which was led by shashi tharoor i will i have uh, something else in yes. mind which we don't have here there are The, in america they have the senate and the house intelligence committees right. where briefings are in confidence 
and we where we do not have we have a situation where the opposition parties for the last 15 days or 20 days since february 14 been saying that they're clueless as to what is going on within the government's mind that is why i am suggesting and any time that they raise these questions they get slammed by the prime minister saying that these people are not only against me but they're against the country that is politics and i am not unfortunately politics I'm, I'm and not, state policies gets intertwined no, but in I, India. I, i'm politics is politics what i am suggesting is a serious conceptual exactly. thing exactly which is that if we had systems in place something like the united states where there are committees intelligence committees committees where the government where everyone because there is a national thing where everyone swears oaths of secrecy right then and there is confidence all around that whatever we are conveying will remain within it will not be used for political purposes it is there then i can tell you that the bureaucracies and the because these are all bureaucracies would be confident to exchange information i'll just if you give me half a second i'll tell you explain something yes. to you or oh, clarify i recollect and this goes back 20 years mm-hmm. mr gujral was was the prime minister pra- no he was then Foreign heading minister. he was heading the standing committee okay on or the consultative committee on uh, on external affairs and members there were pressing i was present as joint secretary the foreign secretary of course was in the chair to give evidence i was assisting him and members were pressing to know what india was doing to assist the f- anti taliban forces in afghanistan right. now mr gujral this would have been there during the india government this was during uh, the india government and mr gujral had remained foreign minister and prime minister right. so he knew fully that we were doing he is the one who's crafted the the composite dialogue eight issues well a uh, composite dialogue process yes. to a great extent so Happened no but i'm talking of this was in yeah, the context the, of afghanistan yeah. so he said what are you people there was whole lot of congress people everyone f- forcing us tell us what are you doing mr gujral let it go on for about 5 minutes and the foreign secretary was giving general answers and then he said i know what everyone is doing no more questions okay so here he was he was in the opposition then he was not part of the nda and he just put an end to it he said i will not have allow this to be discussed why because you didn't have that mechanism i think well said and at that uh, note i'll have to conclude this discussion because uh, we've completely run out of time uh, thank you for having uh, watched this program what mr karju and pravin sani said you know is something very important most importantly you know that we must have situations you know where there is a uh, a st- structure should exist where there is dialogue between the opposition and the government not what we are seeing complete breakdown of communication on both sides where every issue co- becomes a question of scoring political brownie points i'm sure that over the next few weeks we'll see much more of it as we are getting into the elections but we hope that after this elections you know we are able to get a verdict which will possibly allow temperatures to be cool down and then we can reset everything and look at whether we can allow politics and policy to be intermeshed the way it has been over the last few weeks thank you very much for watching this program